Okay, I think we're ready. Good morning, everyone. Hey, we have once again, Dr. Elizabeth Gelazo that will be moderating all of our sessions. So let's give her a round of applause. Good morning. Um, I am going to introduce this um, panel of amazing colleagues here um, who really don't need any introduction, but for some of the newer families who are in the room, um, I'll introduce everybody and then I'm going to turn it over to them. They're going to give us a um, presentation of um, common behavioral issues and um, anxiety um, and issues that can occur across the lifespan in Angelman syndrome. Um, and then we'll have time at the end to do open Q and A. Um, I don't even think they need my moderation today, but um, down the line here, we have Anjali Sadwani, Ann Wheeler, Chris Keery, and Cesar Ochoa. Um, they are truly the experts in the community about behavior and anxiety. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to you guys. I think you have clicker control right here. Good morning. Welcome everyone. I'm Anjali Sadwani. I'm a psychologist at Boston Children's Hospital and our panel today is going to be talking about behavior and anxiety. I just need to check. The clicker will. Oh. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to talk about the most common observed behavior challenges in Angelman syndrome. We're going to talk about anxiety as a root cause of behavior challenges. We've heard a lot about do Angelman kids have autism? So Dr. Ann Wheeler is going to be talking a little bit about the difference between anxiety, um, autism and Angelman syndrome. We're going to go on to then explaining some behavioral strategies for behavior concerns, then talk about medical strategies, and then we're going to open up the floor for questions and answers. We know that behavior problems are common in individuals with Angelman syndromes. They interfere with their ability to interact well in their social environment. And the frequency and severity of behavior problems differ based on molecular subtype. Individuals with deletion tend to have lesser problems than those with non-deletion. Behavior problems, I think, are often the, the source of stress for caregivers and impact the family quality of life. What do we know about behavior problems so far? So this was data from the uh, RDCRN natural history study, and this shows the most common behavior problems as reported by parents. As you can see, mouthing behavior is very, very common. It's, um, it's highest among individuals with um, deletion. Short attention span across the board, across the different molecular subtypes tend to be an issue. Aggressive behaviors tend to be higher in UPD and imprinting defect, but the type of aggressive behavior tends to differ based on molecular subtype. Individuals with UBE3A tend to bite more versus UPD tend to pinch more. Anxiety tends to be more common in individuals with non-deletion compared to those with deletion. We also looked at explosive behavior. Explosive behavior means aggression, tender tantrums. And what we noticed is deletion, uh, individuals with deletion tend to have a lower percentage of explosive behavior compared to those with non-deletion. And we do believe that some of these, um, the differences tend to be because of the lack of the frustration and the inability to communicate and meet their needs, which means more lashing out, more temper, temper tantrums. We also noticed that there are, uh, our kids have a lot of sensory issues, sensory issues like tactile defensiveness, resisting touch, touching on the head, resisting things placed on the head, tend to be higher in individuals with deletion. Now we know why EEGs, MRIs, having LEDs placed on your head is really, really traumatic for a lot of our individuals. When we look at changes in behavior problems over time, if you look at the first graph, we know Irritability increases higher in individuals with UB3A as individuals age. On the other hand, hyperactivity tends to increase across the board as people age across different molecular subtypes. When we look at pinching behaviors, individuals with UPD and imprinting have higher rates of pinching behavior as they age versus anxiety, as we know, tends to be higher in individuals with non-deletion as they age compared to those with deletion. Okay, thanks. Um, so, so we we got this great data to describe the types of behaviors that are um, occurring primarily in 
uh, individuals with Angelman. And so we want to think about what might be some of the underlying causes for this. Um, and so let's see. I want to talk a little bit about anxiety because anxiety is actually in when you look at the clinical features of, of Angelman syndrome, um, anxiety is listed as one of the highly penetrant clinical features, um, which means that it occurs in the majority of individuals with the condition. But it doesn't, anxiety as we know it in the psychiatric literature isn't exactly what, uh, doesn't necessarily translate into what we um, see with Angelman syndrome perfectly. Um, because anxiety is considered an internal disorder. And so it's something that an individual has to be able to express themselves in order to really be called anxiety. Um, but we have a lot of observable behaviors that could be attributed to anxiety. And some of these um, look like irritability and agitation, increased restlessness or distractibility, um, increases in ritualistic or repetitive behaviors, crying or screaming, increases in aggression as we've um, seen with uh, Anjali's data. And then also some somatic concerns like having more swe sweating more, having stomach pains, even, even going to the point of gagging or vomiting. Um, and, and we know parents describe these as behaviors that are associated with anxiety. So there's something, there's something underlying there that we think is, is probably a level of anxiety that we need to um, try to address. So when we think about possible sources for why an individual with Angelman might feel anxious, and this is a slide uh, I want to give credit um, and thanks to one of our colleagues who was supposed to be up here with us, Jane Summers, um, who uh, isn't able to join us in person and we weren't able to get her video in. So she shared some of her slides with us. So I want to make sure to give credit to her. So this is one of her slides and she noted that um, there are several possible sources for why an individual with the Angelman might feel increased anxiety, which might lead to increased behaviors. So it, in a lot of cases, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a few minutes, um, we do see increased anxiety when separated from um, a preferred or a preferred caregiver, somebody who they feel really com comfortable with and who they who helps them feel safe. Um, also, when they go out somewhere new or some, something that's unexpected happens, um, and when their expectations, when they're asked to do something that's beyond their ability level, um, that can be highly anxiety provoking. Um, also, when asked to do, when they, there's too many things going on at once, that can also cause problems with anxiety. And then having some overload in terms of sensory issues can also in, increase that threshold for um, in, in, increased anxiety and more behavioral issues. <clears throat> And so we know that um, most individuals with Angelman syndrome are not able to communicate um, how they're feeling. And so we have to sort of interpret their behaviors um, to understand what they're saying to us. So when we do see these increased behaviors, some of the things that they may be saying are, I'm, I'm nervous about leaving my parents. Um, I don't know what to expect and that makes me scared. I get stressed because the environment is too crowded or too noisy. Uh, or it's too difficult for me to do the things you want me to do, or I'm afraid of the situation because when I go into the situation, I feel pain or discomfort. Um, and I just don't like the way I'm feeling inside and I want to feel something different. And so when we think about that, these are, these are maybe the underlying reasons or the underlying ways that they may be communicating things um, that they're experiencing. And it, it, as it, it, when it comes out, it is um, a challenging behavior to us. So we need to figure out how do we how do we help them communicate their needs and wants and, and express that they're experiencing anxiety without it being um, a challenging or aggressive behavior? So I want to walk through a little bit of the history of my experience with um, individuals with Angelman who have high anxiety and sort of where I, why I, why I wanted to know more and try to figure out how, how, to, how to help with this issue. So in the UNC clinic, we've had a couple individuals who have come in um, who kind of, uh, illustrate some of the issues that we do see, especially with older um, angels. So this was a 20 year old woman who had uh, was deletion positive. And when they came into the clinic, the main concern was that um, mom could never leave the house. Um, so she, if she had to leave the house that somebody else would have to distract the individual with angel syndrome. And then the mom would have to sneak out of the house and, and hope and pray that everything went well. And so it was very stressful for this parent. Um, and when we observed the individual, they were hanging out and fine and calm and relaxed and no problem when mom was around. But as soon as we 
suggested that maybe mom come step out of the room to talk to us. Um, the individual became very much more agitated. So there was um, increased nervous laughter um, that then then turned into hitting, that then turned into biting, that then turned into throwing. Um, and so we could observe that this was a this was a real challenge for this family. Another case is very similar. Um, this was a 25 year old woman, also deletion positive. Um, and they came in with a long history, um, years and years and years of challenges with being able to transition away from the preferred caregiver who was mom. Um, and so in during this during the time of the visit, we asked mom to step out again and um, the patient became very aggressive towards uh, another family member who was in the in the space um, to the point that she pulled hair pulled hair out of the um, family members scalp. Um, and so and this was all with loss of mother's attention, including interruption of eye gaze. So it wasn't just a, I can't be out of the same space with you. I can't not have you looking at me. Um, and so that was also another um, significant challenge for this family. So based on these case studies, we conducted a survey um, to see if this was something that was pervasive in the community or if it was just sort of, you know, one-offs that we were seeing in the clinic. Um, and so we sent the survey out and we asked families to report on whether or not they had any anxiety concerns. So you can see that, um, that we had a majority of individuals over 13 who said that they were concerned about anxiety. It was less or so in the younger children. So you can see this increase, which is what we were seeing in the clinic, that this is more in the later adolescence and into adulthood um, type of behaviors that we see. So then we asked, well, does, does your individual have a caregiver preference? Um, just a preference, which is, you know, not that, that that's something we would expect to see that an individual might have a care, have a preference for a caregiver. Um, and this also seemed to peak in adolescence. Um, and then we said, well, what happens if something, if, if somebody tries to come between you as the care, preferred caregiver and the individual with Angelman, um, and we see loss, uh, agitate, just increased agitation, um, both in terms of, again, losing, losing um, eye contact, losing, uh, being separated in any way. Um, and again, this was peaking in adolescence. And then we also wanted to know, do caregivers, are the caregivers afraid themselves to leave their individual with Angelman syndrome? And there was fewer, um, a lower percentage of that, and this was higher in the younger children, which all makes sense and also um, was somewhat relieving, although we can still see that there are 30% of adults, uh, parents of adults who are, who are really afraid to leave their individual with Angelman syndrome because of the agitation the person experiences. Um, and with uh, similar to what um, Anjali presented, we do see higher concerns um, across the board and anxiety for non-deletion subtypes. So um, I want to now just shift for a second to talk about autism because I think this is another um, highly comorbid condition when you look on paper for this. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, about my stance on this, which is that in most individuals with Angelman, it is not a true autism diagnosis that they may receive. Although autism, I think helps, having that diagnosis helps get services. So we know that. <laughs> but just to think about this um, in terms of what actually um, may be happening. So with autism, this is a behavioral diagnosis. So it's based on what we observe the individual to be doing and um, uh, in, in everyday interactions with people. Um, and it's defined by deficits in social communication. And these can be deficits, both verbal and nonverbal um, deficits. Um, they have restricted and repetitive behaviors. Um, and sometimes individuals with autism can have comorbid seizures. Um, most of the time, if they have any um, head circumference challenges, it's macrocephaly, which means they have larger heads. Um, you can see autism symptoms early in development. And usually the way we think about it is that it's not better explained by a severe intellectual disability, which in our case with Angelman syndrome, would automatically sort of make you question if it's autism. And it's very difficult to diagnose children with autism who are developmentally younger than 18 months. Um, most, most people will not diagnose a kid with autism if they're that young. Um, and then when we think about Angelman, this is a different condition, right? So it's genetically diagnosed. We know what causes it. Um, we do know that UB3A is implicated in both Angelman and autism. Um, so there, there is some evidence that there's some overlap there. Um, but we know that kids with Angelman have severe deficits in communication. We do see repetitive movements. Um, co uh, uh, seizures are highly comorbid, but usually an individual with Angelman might have microcephaly, which means a smaller head. Um, also, the, the 
the happy laughter um, that is so indicative of Angelman syndrome can be seen as a symptom of autism, but also shows that they are highly socially interested, which is not what we see in autism. Um, and also, I think an important point when it comes to diagnosis is that children with Angelman syndrome do not typically score at a developmental level over you know, 24 to 36 months, which makes it much harder for us to, to diagnose autism in a real, true, valid fashion. So I think I, I put this out there to say that autism is a, um, is a challenging diagnosis for any condition, anybody, but I think it's really hard to put it on, place it on top of Angelman syndrome. Now, I say that all with a caveat that we know that getting services for autism helps, um, and we know that interventions that are focused on autism can be beneficial. So there's this, there's this tension for us as clinicians about what to do with the autism piece. Okay, so now we're going to shift a little bit just to, this are the last these two set parts of the sessions were just to um, really let you know that we know this is an issue and we're we're paying attention and we're trying to figure out the best ways to help support the challenging behaviors that we see in individuals with Angelman. So I'm going to pass this back now to Anjali and talk a little bit about some other um, strategies. When we see behaviors, we're very, we really want to understand what is happening. When is, when, when is it happening and what is your child trying to communicate? So we just want to, I'm putting out the examples that we've seen and what we're trying to interpret your child's behavior and what they're trying to communicate. The first one says a new therapist is coming over and, it's, and, and the child knows a new therapist is coming over. As soon as the new therapist walks into the house, the child will cling to you, distress, start hitting, throwing. What the child is trying to communicate is I, I am afraid I don't know this person. At school, and this is very common and we've heard it a lot, the teacher or the aide will take out some learning material. As soon as that happens, the child will throw things. Your child is trying to communicate that this is too hard. I don't want to do it. I'm not interested. Uh, the next one is when you're taking your child out in public, right? You're taking them to the mall. You're taking them to the amusement park. You're taking them to the water park. As soon as you get out of the car or you step into the water park, your child freaks out, freezes, doesn't move. He's trying to communicate that I'm scared of crowds and noises. I'm overwhelmed. So what we want to do is try and understand these behaviors. Why is it happening? And what does your child do to get out of it? We strongly believe that all behavior has a function. When children are in situations where they're distressed or challenged, they tend to eat. Everybody eats. They're doing certain behaviors to get out of that situation. So eats is they'll try, if they're in a distressful or challenging situation, they'll try and escape and get out and avoid it. Or they may be doing certain behaviors to get your attention because this is how they best learn to get your attention. Or they may want to seek a particular object or a preferred object or reward, or they're sensory seeking or they're overwhelming. So when we see some of these uh, challenging behaviors, we always want to interpret it through the eats lenses. What is happening? Why is your child doing these behaviors? One of the things as clinicians and behavior therapists we do is try and do a functional behavior analysis of the behavior, especially behaviors that are specifically challenging. We want to try and understand what are the triggers of the behavior? What's setting this child off? When does it happen? What's the context? How often does it happen? What's going on at that time? How long, does, how long does that behavior take place? And what happens after that? So we tend to do an ABC analysis. A is the antecedent, what happened? B is the behavior that your child engaged in. And C is what the consequences. And a lot of times the behavior is directly linked to the consequence. And we'll talk through an example of it. We see that the child, the teacher tells Peter, let's sit in a circle. So Peter starts pulling another child's hair. What happens after that? The aide takes Peter out of the room. What did your child just do? He escaped, right? He got what he wanted. And once we realize that, that this was his behavior to get it out, we can try and fix that, that he doesn't get to avoid the situation. So we can talk about how different things we can use to figure out the eats behavior. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say this. Um, this was data from the natural history study and we were looking at why do some of these behaviors occur? And we specifically asked parents, why do these behaviors occur? A majority of 
um, parents said that this, that a lot of these challenges behaviors occur because the child just wants to communicate with you. So he's throwing to get your attention or, or he's, he's trying to communicate his needs. It's also attention seeking, and then it's for avoidance and for sensory seeking. So these are the different purposes behaviors occur. Okay. So when we're in a clinic and we're talking about some of the strategies that can be used to help with some of these different types of functions of behaviors, um, we think about, again, these, these different strategies, these different functions that have been reported to be the main cause of a lot of behaviors, or at least perceived to be the main cause of the behaviors. So when we think about communication as one of our primary ones, um, of course, we want to think about how can we best help the individual communicate better. So, you know, things like use of the AAC, teaching that system and teaching it early and using it consistently, um, making sure that that's available and accessible at all times and integrated into the individual's daily life and that there's a responsive communication partner and thinking about, and this could be, you know, if, if not AAC device, it's really about like, like narrowing it down to what is the, what is the easiest way for that individual to communicate what they need without engaging in behavior. So if it's a quiet hand, if it's, you know, whatever it is that helps them get a strategy to let you know what they need without, um, without aggression. If it's a sensory issue, you can work with an OT to identify what kind of sensory input might be the, um, might be use useful to help calm and reduce the behaviors. Um, thinking about what might be happening with sensory aversion. So, you know, we see some kids who really respond well by having um, the ears covered that, so they don't have as much noise coming in. So that if that's, if loud noises are a, stra are a problem, that's a strategy that can be very helpful. Um, and then there are things like when there's sen sensory seeking. So we know a lot of individuals with Angelman syndrome have oral motor seeking, um, sensory seeking, and that that can lead to biting when aggressive, when feeling agitated. So making sure that there are other things that are appropriate for them to, to use to seek, to seek out that sensory input. If the main function of a behavior is getting attention, it's important to ignore and re ignore and redirect the undesirable behavior and not directly engage it, engage with it because then that increases, then you've given the attention to the task, to the behavior that they um, have exhibited. So this is a very, very hard thing to do, but it is really important to practice it. So when it's an engage, and it's a challenging behavior, it is important to say, I'm not going to engage in this, I'm going to ignore it. When you do something that I want you to do, when you change the way you're handling this, you get all the attention that you want. Um, so you direct them to a desired behavior and then they get the attention. And then you reinforce that this is the way to get my attention. If the function is escape, um, it's important to allow that escape, but only under the um, under the context in which you it's a, a appropriate escape. So providing more breaks um, can be a really important thing, and sort of an if then like do this, then we get a break. Um, and providing choice whenever possible can really be helpful. Um, and then when the behavior is appropriate, then you can provide the escape that they are looking for. So these are just simple, simplistic um, list of strategies that I don't want to um, make any mistake. We know that these are hard to implement, but these are the types of things that we know can be successful. And so we really try to encourage and support families in trying to um, use these strategies. There's also some environmental modifications that can be really, really helpful. Um, most individuals will respond well when you have a consistent and structured routine. Um, use of visual cues can be very helpful for some individuals. So things like visual schedules or use of timers, visual timers especially can be really helpful. Um, making sure that you're working in the duration um, that is uh, that the individual is capable of working in. So if you have a longer period of time, you're going to, and then they're not, they don't have the endurance for that, you're going to see more behaviors where if you can chunk it into smaller intervals, um, that can sometimes be much more helpful making sure that there are reinforcers and preferred items and that attention when they are doing something that you want them to be doing so that that becomes the 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 go-to to get the attention or um, to get out of whatever it is they're doing. Uh, some, some families and teachers find if then, using if then boards and if then strategies to be really helpful. So if you do X, Y, Z, or if you stop X, Y, Z, then we do A, B, C. Um, and then always being, you know, planful and mindful of 
as transitions come up, as you're meeting new people, as you're going into high, more highly sensory um, stimulating environments, you're going to need to be planning for that and thinking about what kinds of things might be helpful to reduce that anxiety and um, reduce the, the uh, likelihood that there may be some challenging behaviors. And, you know, we often rec uh, recommend that if you have the ability and you have the resources to do so, that having a behavioral specialist who can come in and actually follow along with your routines and see where the behaviors are coming up and actually do a real um, co comprehensive functional behavioral analysis like Anjali had shown you can really be incredibly beneficial for helping figure out what the core, what the core um, uh, antecedents and consequences are that are driving the behaviors and the continuing behaviors. And sometimes it's just very hard to see because you're in a, you're in a family dynamic and you're interacting with your individual because you're their caregiver or their family member and trying to think through all of these behavioral strategies on top of it can be really challenging. So having a behavioral specialist who can come in and kind of give you that direct guidelines can be really helpful. And then, of course, there's medication. So I'm going to turn it over to our wonderful physicians here who can talk about medication strategies. Hello. Um, so, um, Angelman syndrome individuals have um, a wide range of um, behavioral and emotional difficulties. Some um, some angels have an easygoing temperament and are often happy and, and don't have a lot of challenges, but others do. Um, sometimes they can be very sensitive to sensory uh, stimuli in the environment. Uh, a lot of them are very hyperactive uh, and impulsive. Um, some have a really hard time going out uh, and get very stressed out uh, in different situations to the point that can interfere with their ability to participate in community activities, um, activities with the family. And, and all families want to integrate their, their um, angels as much as possible. So anxiety can get on the way of, you know, of doing things, basic things, uh, there can be disruptive behaviors. Some uh, have very aggressive behaviors towards others, towards self, have big outbursts in different situations. So sometimes, um, you know, the situation is so difficult that families may want to consider the possibility of uh, medication to help address the behavioral and emotional difficulties, which is, is, is a hard decision. As a parent, I can try to project myself and I could think that this is a very tough decision, but um, the bottom line is to have um, your children, your angels, to be able to integrate and to have like a, a, a really the opportunity to take advantage of therapies, learning opportunities, and, and at that time, uh, medication for behavior and anxiety might be an option. So um, here we have a summary of the, um, the situations where um, you may want to consider um, pharmacological therapy for behavior and emotions. When uh, usually the first line of intervention is trying behavioral therapy, like the one that was discussed before. Uh, if there's no improvement with behavioral therapy, you may want to consider this option. When there's concern about safety, uh, particularly with the, the younger siblings, um, when uh, it's impossible for the family to go out and to participate in community activities, um, when you know you cannot find a uh, aftercare program that can um, provide care to to your um, child with Angelman syndrome, and when safety is an issue, when safety for others and for themselves is an issue. Um, pharmacotherapy can be really effective. It's a little scary because, you know, talking about behavioral uh, and emotional medication sounds like a, a big step up. But um, sometimes, you know, ideally you need to find the right uh, clinician, somebody that you can trust, and uh, that is uh, usually a psychiatrist, but can also be a neurologist or a developmental behavioral pediatrician. So here we have a case. This is Alice. Uh, it's a 19-year-old woman with Angelman via uniparental disomy, uh, increasingly upset with separation from parent, agitation and aggressive behaviors with limit setting, especially around food, and uh, community outings are increasingly, increasingly unpredictable and dangerous. So um, 
the first thing we try to do is think about, is there something medical that could make um, this individual with Angerman syndrome more irritable, more um, uh, frustrated, more easily frustrated? So sleep is one of the big factors, but I'm not gonna talk much about that because Dr. Kier in the next presentation is gonna talk about sleep difficulties, but that's something that we consider and we target if it's an issue. Constipation. Constipation is a very common problem in angels. And uh, I've learned from my experience in pediatrics and developmental behavioral pediatrics that you know, constipation can have a big impact causing um, irritability, can cause a lot of irritability and can decrease appetite, uh, can make um, you know, um, children and adolescents and adults easily frustrated. So sometimes parents overlook that, the constipation, but that's an important factor that needs to be addressed. Reflux, gastroesophageal reflux, is not uncommon in individuals with Angerman syndrome and can make them irritable. Particularly, you should suspect gastroesophageal reflux when the irritability, when the outbursts are associated with meals, after meals. Uh, also, dysmenorrhea, like the, the irritability, the pain that comes around menstrual periods. Um, Dental problems is something that sometimes people don't think much about it, but you know it's so important that uh, Angerman individuals get to see the the dentist on a regular basis. Uh, and sometimes you know it's overlooked because it's so hard to take them to the dentist and have them open in the mouth. Uh, but it's it's really important to search in the community for dentists that uh, have expertise working with uh, individuals with developmental differences. And some of the angels may need some uh, anesthesia. Some of them use like the gas, nitric uh, gas, and that that can allow like exams and also treatment for dental difficulties. Uh, and we should we should always think about that when there's a lot of irritability. Uh, scoliosis can cause pain and pain can cause irritability and that should not be overlooked. And seizures, seizures are so frequent in, in Angerman syndrome patients and sometimes having a, a lot of seizures that might or might not be recognized or sometimes the medications that are used to treat the seizures can cause more irritability. So we, uh, as clinicians, we need to analyze all these factors before uh, and also um, trying the behavioral therapy that was described before, before thinking about um, doing uh, psychopharmacological medication. So um, the first thing we do is we try to do an evaluation for medical contributors. Um, individuals with Angerman syndrome have a lot of uh, sensory processing differences. They can be very sensitive to certain stimuli in the environment, like sounds, uh, heat, um, clothes um, that can make them very irritable. And uh, it's, it's very helpful to have um, an occupational therapy. Occupational therapists are the clinicians that have expertise in analyzing and helping address these sensory processing differences. So um, we discuss about the function, the, the functions of behavior were discussed. So uh, being able to communicate can alleviate some of these um, challenges. So trying to, we, we try to encourage uh, families to use augmentative communication strategies because the more that um, Angerman syndrome individuals can communicate their wants, their needs, or the things that they don't like uh, can be more effective to addressing behavioral challenges. Also, um, you know, a lot of uh, individuals with Angerman syndrome have a difficult time with unpredictability with new situations. So if there is a schedule um, that they can understand and they can follow, that can be really helpful to, to prevent um, behavioral challenges. Um, I'm not going to talk more about behavioral therapy. It was discussed extensively, but that's something that we think about uh, when we are treating um, individuals with Angerman syndrome with anxiety or disruptive behaviors. Um, psychological therapy is an option. It's like a more specialized, trying to do gradual exposure to stimuli that are, um, you know, hard for, for individuals with Angerman syndrome. It's something that can be done too. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the medications that we use. And, um, you know, there are different, there's um, hyperactivity, impulsivity uh, that Dr. Kerry is going to talk about. There's anxiety and there's emotional regulation and aggressive behaviors. 
So I'm going to talk a lot about uh, pharmacological interventions on um, anxiety and emo um, emotional regulation problems. So in, in, in general practice, the first line of intervention for anxiety is the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like sertraline or Zoloft, fluoxetine or Prozac, acetylopram or uh, Lexapro, um, so those are the medications that are used in general practice, but something that has been found is that uh, a lot of the Angelman syndrome patients are sensitive to those medications and can get irritable on that. We can still use those medications, but we got to go very gradually with the small doses and build up uh, very gradually because they can be very sensitive and can get very irritable on them, causing the, the opposite effect that we are aiming for. So something that has um, the, the Angelman community has figured out is that Buspiron, which for regular patients is more like a second or third line medication for anxiety, um, seems to work well for not for all, but for many uh, patients with Angelman syndrome. So that's a medication that we often consider first when we are dealing with a lot of anxiety. So this is uh, also increases the, the serotonin levels, particularly at the receptor um, one um, A level, and, and that way seems to help with, with anxiety. And we start like we do with many medications, uh, unlike patients that don't have Angelman syndrome, always with small doses, and we build up the levels gradually until we find the, uh, the sweet spot where you see a good effect and uh, uh, minimal side effects. Something that uh, I hear uh, a lot of families, they are a little scared about the side effects. And they say, you know, I don't wanna put my kid on a medication because that's gonna, that can change his personality or her personality is gonna change who or she is. And uh, that can happen. I always tell families, yes, you can change your child's personality when you try psychopharmacology, but, uh, but we're, not, we're aiming for the improvement for decreasing the anxiety, decreasing the dysregulation, so they can be more available, so they can be more themselves. But on the way, we can cause side effects and we can make them different. But if we do, we don't have to stay there. You know, if, if you have a good communication with your clinician and you hit side effects, then you take a step down on the medication or you switch the medication but you don't have to stay on a medic, your, your child doesn't have to stay on a medication that is causing side effects and is changing his or her personality. I think that's an important concept to, to have. Um, so there are options for treatment for less severe cases. For less severe cases, we use the, you know, we can use the uh, SSRIs, the ones that I mentioned before. Uh, there's a, a study from the Vanderbilt group that um, showed that mirtazapine which is a, an antidepressant medication that has effects on serotonin, seems to work really well for Angelman syndrome patients. Uh, benzodiazepines seem to help. These are anti-seizure medications that also have an anti-anxiety effect that can be used also to help with anxiety. And there's propanolol. Propanolol is a medication that can be used for high blood pressure, for um, some heart rhythm problems that is technically is not an anxiety medication, but has an, a calming um, effect and can relieve anxiety and can be very effective for, for some of the Angelman syndrome patients. So then, then we go to the more severe cases when there's aggression, there's a lot of dysregulation. Um, the, sometimes the Angelman syndrome patients hit others and themselves or bite. Uh, and in those cases, you know, life can be very difficult for families and, and for the siblings. And when they go to school, they cannot really be, um, you know, they cannot integrate in the school. They cannot take advantage of the services. And then we use like um, uh, medications like uh, antipsychotic medications, which sound very like, like, a, hard, like a hard medication. Uh, but those medications, when they are well used, can be very helpful can be very helpful in, in, in bringing down this, this intensity, this dysregulation, this, this aggression. But on the other hand, they also can cause side effects. So we, we are very careful when we prescribe them and we try to monitor the side effects. One of the, the big side effects of the, these atypical antipsychotics like Risperidone, Abilify, or Quetiapine 
are that um, they increase appetite. So uh, patients can gain weight and have more risk for having metabolic conditions like diabetes or coronary disease in, 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 in the long run. But um, we try to monitor weight, try to adjust the dose. We sometimes try to use other medications that can shield them from these side effects, like um, metformin is a medication that is used for diabetes, and sometimes it's used along with these medications to decrease appetite and also for to decrease the chance of developing diabetes or, um, or these metabolic problems. Um, the other, the other um, line, but sometimes they don't work well or they cause too many side effects. So in those cases, we, we sometimes look at other options for, for uh, emotional dysregulation. And uh, sometimes uh, there are anti-seizure medications that have an effect on mood, like topiramate or topamax is a medication that uh, seems to help decrease appetite so they don't eat that much and also helps with emotional regulation. Then there is um, Lamotrigin or Lamictal. It's a medication that has been found to be helpful sometimes with emotional regulation, with aggression. You have uh, Valproic Acid or Depakote um, that also can be helpful. Um, something that is used, um, there's uh, CBD oil. CBD oil uh, is, uh, has been used successfully as one of the uh, anti-seizure medications and it seems to have an effect of emotional regulation. So that's another medication that can be used. Um, Clobazam is like a, like a benzodiazepine that is also used for seizures that can help with anxiety. So those are, there are a lot of options of medications and uh, sometimes we have to try different medications and, and sometimes parents can feel a little sensitive about, okay, uh, are you going to experiment with my child? Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes when the behaviors are so difficult and are interfering with the functioning, with the safety of the family, you gotta try them. But, you know, I think if you have a, you work with a clinician when there's good communication and you know that the clinician is listening to you, you can go through this journey. And I, in my experience doing psychopharmacology, I've had some, you know, tough cases when things are difficult, but when there's a good communication between the family and the clinician, and, um, you know, you can try a couple of things and then eventually you can get to the place where you can address uh, a lot of these challenges. Okay, now it's Dr. Kerry. Okay, I'm gonna try and take us home here within times. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, again, my name is uh, Chris Kerry. Let's see if I can figure this out here. Got it. Okay, I'm going to review two cases and in the same format that Dr. Ochoa followed, um, talk a little bit about treatments that can be helpful from a medication standpoint. We've had some great content already talking about behavioral approaches and assessment. So my focus will be a large on medications, although it should all be ideally put together um, and not just medicines. So Sam is a seven-year-old boy with, uh, with Angelman. His mechanism of inheritance for Angelman is a UBE3A mutation which, as we know uh, from Dr. Sadwani's presentation, can be associated with perhaps higher levels of behavioral concerns, and then perhaps, on average, some better motor function. And Sam's motor function is really good. Uh, he is fully ambulatory. He walks well. He runs really well. Uh, he's able to make his way up and down stairs using a, a railing. He's made some wonderful motor gains. But the other side of the coin is that he is in movement 100% of the time. And uh, Sam just does not stop. Um, and that is increasingly creating challenges for Sam at school and with community outings. He has a constant need to move, explore. While parents want to encourage this exploration drive for him to sort of explore his world, he kind of takes a lot of things apart inadvertently. He's got kind of a curiosity that can be a little destructive, um, making it very hard to go on any community outings. You kind of take apart like department store sections and things like that. So it's really hard to go out into the community and give Sam a chance to experience new things. And Sam really struggles with holding his attention 
on any academic demand or therapy for more than really a couple seconds. He is persistently distracted by his love for peers, his peers at school, uh, which is again a strength, but also a double-edged sword because he it it makes it really hard for him to uh, focus in any sort of integrated academic environment. And it's like all of the work needs to be completely separate from his peers who he loves. So that has made that sort of constant distractibility and need to constantly move during therapies has really slowed down his progress. So these are some of the main concerns the family has in, uh, in, in presenting. So again, separate from the things we can think about as academic supports, Things like, for instance, having smaller class size for the most important therapies, for instance, having constant movement breaks for adults who may have a day program, having constant physical activity integrated into their day program or daytime routine. Separate from all these supports, let's talk about sort of medication related efforts. Um, so I'm going to first talk about we're essentially going to be talking about treatments for this high energy, this hyperactivity, this severe distractibility. And let's talk first about two medications called guanfacine and clonidine, both of which have immediate release and uh, extended release versions for people who can swallow capsules. Not most of my kids and adults with Angelman uh, patients, but for some people who can swallow uh, capsules, there's long acting versions as well. The way these medicines work is think about the fight or flight response and uh, that sort of heart rate going up, blood pressure going up, you're breathing faster, your heart rate's going faster, all of that sort of fear or anger response, maybe there's some nausea related to that, that sort of suite of physiologic responses that are part of the fight or flight response. Uh, these classes of medicines kind of do the opposite of that. Um, they um, act in the opposite way of norepinephrine, or colloquially, you might think of that as adrenaline. And in that way, they can be calming and sort of do the opposite of the fight or flight response. Um, these, uh, so guanfacine and clonidine, guanfacine is kind of a longer acting version of this medication and clonidine is sort of a shorter acting version. If you or I took clonidine, we would probably want to take a three hour nap right after we took it. So it, it can be challenging to use during the day and guanfacine a little bit more effective during the day. But both these medications treat hyperactivity. Um, things to think about in terms of side effects of these medications is that they can worsen constipation. And that's the most common reason I stop them for kids and adults with Angelman is there's already a constipation problem. You've kind of made it worse. You got to kind of watch that and look to make sure you're not causing more harm than good. Because like Dr. Ochoa said, you can see constipation drive behaviors. So you got to watch for that one. And you could also see some tiredness during the day. I know when I'm tired, I'm more irritable. So in situations where I think this medicine has made people more irritable, it's probably because I've made them inadvertently tired. So those are the most common side effects to watch for with this class of medications. But it's a very sensible place to start to try and help someone with hyperactivity. There's a medication called atomoxetine. The other name for this is Stratera. All these medicines have got two names, I think, partially to confuse us. Um, there's the name of the molecule itself, and then there's the name of the, the sort of the advertising name the drug companies have come up with. Uh, atomoxetine has, um, it's kind of a little bit illogical here. It, it actually increases norepinephrine, which is the stress hormone I told you about. But it acts, the, the way in which it's thought to work is it increases norepinephrine in a part of the brain called the frontal lobe areas, which are responsible for inhibiting impulses. And uh, atomoxetine, in that way, it's, it's a long-acting medicine. It works constantly throughout the day, and it can help with hyperactivity. Um, the challenge with this medicine is it's got to be swallowed, which makes it off the table for many people with Angelman. However, they just recently have made this uh, sort of Me Too drug for this, medica uh, for this uh, medication called uh, Veloxazine. You might have heard of it. And that is that can be put on a little yogurt or applesauce or so you don't need to swallow a tablet. So that's opened up this, this medication, this mechanism of action to a larger group of individuals who can't swallow capsules and could be a, therefore really something worth considering and worth trying. Um, the big side effects to watch for with this medicine, it can decrease appetite, maybe a good thing, may, may also be a really bad thing for people who are already underweight. Um, it can cause fatigue during the day. You can see nausea with it. 
Um, some people can get a little more irritable. Those are the most common reasons I've stopped this medicine for, uh, uh, for a person with Angelman or, or other developmental delay. Those, those right there are the most common treatments I'd think about for hyperactivity. You'll see here that I've not put what are called stimulant medications, psychostimulants. You've probably heard of these, Ritalin, Adderall, Metadate, Concerta. You, you've probably heard of these in the media. These are your typical treatments for hyperactivity. And for whatever reason, I've really struggled to um, have this be helpful for people with Angelman. Uh, we did a study where we asked 50 families um, what treatments have they tried for hyperactivity? And a large number had tried stimulants, zero had stuck with it because of side effects related to it. And side effects can include irritability, um, decreased appetite. Um, so it, stimulant medication should really be thought about. And again, stimulants, Ritalin, Adderall, take, undertaken with great caution for kids and adults with an Angelman diagnosis, starting at the lowest possible dosages, trying some of these other things first, um, which is a little counterintuitive because most prescribing clinicians would think hyperactivity, stimulants. So you just, I would, um, I encourage clinicians to just be a little careful with that class of medicines in Angelman. Um, things to try before that, if these aren't options, um, serotonergic medications were talked about by Dr. Ochoa. These medicines are treatments for anxiety and they're treatments for depression. Anecdotally, a number of families told me that this helped somewhat with hyperactivity. It's a little counterintuitive, but it's, um, it looks like it's better tolerated than stimulant medicines. So it's something worth considering. I've put here at the end, really in the most severe of situations, medicines that are um, antipsychotic medications. Um, these are situations to think about where there's a lot of irritability, which is to say quick progress to anger, aggression, self-injury, where that's a really persistent, severe, comorbid problem with hyperactivity. Any psychotic medicines, I think of these medicines not as treating psychosis per se, but acting as mood stabilizers, helping with the quickness of mood change. Um, and they can help with hyperactivity as well. Because of weight gain and other side effects, they really should be considered kind of last before other things because appetite can increase. You can see tremors increase or muscle spasms, which are already, you know, tremors and myoclonus already a concern for people with Angelman. But I could think of five or six people where this medication really made a major difference for them in terms of decreasing aggression. But again, severe cases only. All right. I'm not too over with time, I am. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes here, I'm just gonna talk about the last case, Jaden. Uh, Jaden's 14, his mechanism of inheritance for Angelman is a maternal deletion. And Jaden, uh, Jaden's parents always felt blessed around Jaden's sleep. His sleep was really good with just a small amount of melatonin. And then the pandemic hits. And everyone is all together under the same roof all the time for a year. And all of a sudden, it's gotten a lot harder for Jaden to separate from his family. When dad goes back to work um, in person, Jaden is, is very upset that his dad is gone and is sort of asking for him constantly during the day. And Jaden is now having a lot of trouble separating from his parents at night, almost like it's, it's, it's harder for him at this point. Now he's taking hours to fall asleep where before he used to initiate sleep within 20 minutes with a little melatonin. And he's, when he's waking up at night, he's engaging in challenging behavior to try and bring his parents back into the room. And he could be up for hours in the middle of the night if they try to wait him out. So all of a sudden sleep is a major concern for Jaden. Um, so uh, obviously before we think about medications, um, the family is thinking about here in this way, how do we avoid um, going into the room whenever Jaden is upset to not have us there to help him with getting more comfortable with that separation? This is a really common problem for kids and adults with Angelman. And medications can sometimes play, play a role in helping increase the sleep drive that kids and adults with Angelman have that appears to be, for whatever reason, decreased for people with Angelman, less of a sleep drive. It's very common for a lot of people with Angelman to have less need for sleep. They can go for four hours while everyone else in the family is exhausted the next day. Um, a really common story. So medications increase the sleep drive. They increase the, the, the need for sleep, the tiredness, and that combined with a behavioral intervention to try and avoid reinforcing the behavior by going in a lot, that can help increase the sleep drive. So like, for instance, if there's a family that 
where their loved one is waking up in the middle of the night and they're up for three hours, four hours. A medication that increases the sleep drive may have that now be just 30 minutes or something like that because there's more of a desire to fall back asleep. So medications can play a major role here. Melatonin is the one medication that we're talking about today that's actually been formally studied in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial in Angelman and found to be effective. It doesn't work for some individuals, but it's a great place to start if you haven't tried anything. And um, really everybody should have a trial of it that has a major problem with sleep where a behavioral approach didn't help. Um, and that study also found excellent tolerability. No, no real concerns of side effects as compared to placebo. Then two medicines I wanna tell you about. In that study, I told you about a 50 families where we asked them what medications did you take. Clonidine and trazodone were the ones that stood out that families had the most success with, stuck with the longest and had the least side effects. So if you're looking for something that appears to be more safe for kids and adults with Angelman, these two medicines stand out. Uh, clonidine is really effective for that initial separation. It helps with sleep initiation. Like I said, it, you know, it really increases the sleep drive, makes you more tired, but it's short acting, lasts four hours maybe. So it's not a great choice for middle of the night waking up. Trazodone is a much better choice for middle of the night waking up because it lasts eight hours long. Um, it, I've had a lot of families where that three hour in the middle of the night wake up went to half an hour, 20 minutes or, or disappeared entirely. Um, and those are kind of three places to, to definitely start. There's a medicine called mirtazapine, also called Remeron, that can be very effective for sleep. It increases appetite, which may put it farther down in the list. Unless someone is low weight, then it's a great choice. Uh, it's actually an antidepressant medication, but just very effective as a sleep medicine um, and is worth considering. It was also studied in a uh, sort of a case series in Angelman and found to be well tolerated. So... Um, and then I've put here last, another antipsychotic medicine. Again, we're putting these class of medicines at the end because they increase appetite so much, but uh, this particular medicine is less likely to cause movement side effects, tremor, muscle spasms among the antipsychotic medicines. And uh, it may help a little bit with aggression or self-injury during the day. So for that reason, it can be considered for people who've got those kind of challenges in addition to sleep. All right, how'd I do on time? It's 10 o'clock. So we've let, left ourselves 30 minutes for, for questions uh, to make sure that uh, we, uh, we give plenty of time and Liz is gonna help facilitate. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you all, that was fabulous. Go ahead, feel free to come on up. That was awesome. <laughs> um, a couple of questions. Was that clonidine? for the hyperactivity, was that clonidine plus um, guanathin or one or the other? Really? Or both? Is this working? Yep. How about now? People can still hear me? Great. Um, yeah, the question was, I listed guanfacine and clonidine. And the question was, is that a combination of the two? No, it's either one or the other okay. is the answer to the question. Um, the medicines are similar in terms of how they affect. And so they can synergistically work together. So you need to be thinking about, there's my alarm telling me to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there, I have had some kids I've worked with who take guanfacine during the day and a small dosage of clonidine at night to help with sleep. But the prescribing clinician should think about the combined amount of that medication in 24 hours to make sure they're not causing over sedation or too much constipation. Second question. Have you know, is changing in those kinds of medications to trying to find the right thing to help your children for whatever they're going through? Have y'all seen that as an exclusion criteria for any of the um, genetic trials? I know that changes in seizures is an exclusion criteria. So uh, for the clinical trials, um, they ask that you don't change the medication dose in the three months prior to participation, that the conditions are stable. But once they are enrolled and then the the, the medication stops working, you can adjust sometimes, but you need to coordinate with the uh, study team. Okay, but it generally it's three months. So if they're on something and they're stable for three months prior, you're yeah. good. Ideally should be, yeah, three months. Hi, I have a 24 year old daughter who has pica and I, we've been struggling with her eating just 
like wood and rocks and random things. And she did this when she was about 12 or 14. We had a run of this with this um, pica issue. How much of pica is related to constipation, medication, anxiety? I've just, I can't figure out what the trigger is or if there's a trigger. Um, I don't know. Any ideas? Well, they don't know. <laughs> uh, okay, great question. The question was pica, what is driving it? Is there any clear precipitant? I think um, Dr. Sidwani's section around looking at the antecedent and the consequence is really instructive here. In my experience, a lot of pica is sensory seeking behaviors rather than attention seeking per se. Um, although, it, I don't know, maybe you all have different experiences with it. It could potentially be, be, be attention seeking. But I think about for a lot of individuals with Angelman syndrome, they have a, a strong oral fixation around repetitive chewing, spitting, um, oral movements, and or a real uh, proclivity and interest in um, in using uh, sensory supports that may involve a lot of chewing. So I think about that in the case that you're talking about, could it be, could it po be possible that um, they might uh, benefit from having some sort of chewy toy? This may be things you've already tried, chewy toys or some preferred chewy thing that they're using during the day that could protect their teeth, not harm their teeth, right. um, that is distracting them from from picking things up. Well, what it, what she does is it's kind of interesting. Like she'll she'll use the chewy. I, I you might have saw her leave with that. I gave her a chewy thing and she was chewing on it. But it's rocks. Like she'll go outside and she'll sit where there's rocks and the the rocks are warm because they're in the sun and like she'll hold it in her mouth. Like she'll sift through them, but she'll sit the rock like in her mouth and just let it sit there. And I'm not sure if it, I, I do think it's a sensory thing, but why does it come and go? Like, that's the part I'm confused about. Like, uh, Dr. Sidwani is bringing up a really good point here to make sure in some cases of pica can be driven by iron deficiency or- Right, right. and we've had that conversation. Now. I bet you that's been tested for, be my guess. Yeah. A lot of time that's tested, found to be normal, but you don't want to miss that. It's a right. good thing to not miss. Is, um, but it, this is one area where an occupational therapy consultation, if possible, again, these services are harder to find for adults, would maybe really instructive. Is there anything that is unique to that sensory experience that your loved one is seeking that could be replaced with some safer intervention? And then can everybody that works with them uh, be encouraged to replace that mm -hmm. with this more safe way to get that feeling? Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I have a son, Taylor. He's 11 years old yesterday. So I guess I'm gonna piggyback off of um, the lady that just spoke. So he also, he drools a lot and I'm sure all of us kind of like experienced that. So of course I got the custom eye bibs and things like that. And of course we're trying to like explore the different sensory needs or whatever. My question is, um, at the previous conference, um, I know our families, we kind of share a lot of information with one another to kind of see what helps. And there was like a medication that can kind of like help with the drool. Um, and then I also heard that as the kids get older, that the drool are like tend to subside. So if you all can share the name, if you know of that medication, it kind of like help with the drool outside of us having like occupational therapy or whatever, because now he's in middle school and you know, we're already trying to make sure that they feel um, normal as possible and not be the target. So if you all can share that, the name of that medication. Or a family member? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the question again is, are there medication-based interventions that can help with drooling? Yes. It's a really great question. Yes. Um, because um, it is, uh, you're right, this is a very consistent problem. Um, for a lot of people with Angelman, it can be a hygiene issue, it can be stigmatizing. So absolutely, it's a big issue. Um, there are um, 
medications that can cause drooling, in fact, some of the antipsychotic medications we talked about, and a common thing that's done for people who need to take that type of medication is something called a scopolamine patch. Um, it's essentially um, has, in, the way that it works is a, a, it's an anticholinergic medication that decreases oral secretions. Okay. And um, while I have not a lot, had a lot of experience of seeing it tried in Angelman syndrome, it's something worth considering. Benadryl might also decrease oral secretions some, and a lot of individuals of Angelman might take Benadryl for sleep. Um, a reasonable thing to try can cause sedation the next day. Um, and so those are probably, I might think about Benadryl first before scopolamine patch per se. The risks with these classes of medicines, constipation, if the dosage is too high, it can cause confusion, like feeling out of it, sort of drugged appearing. Um, and um, let's see, I don't know if anything else is coming to mind in terms of potential risks. In my mind, it's, it's worth considering, but it's also worth making sure it's not reflux. That could be, re, uh, heavy drooling can be caused by reflux. You might look to see, is it happening after specific foods? Is it happening after acidic foods, after meals specifically? Okay. And... Um, yeah. How do you spell that medication? How do you spell scopolamine? Not the Benadryl. I think we all yeah. have to spell that. Scopolamine S. Oh boy. I'm gonna write it down before I embarrass yeah. myself in front no. of everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I'll come I'll come up after the panel. I don't want to hold up too much time to get the name. S C O P O L A M I N E. Okay, thank you. <laughs> up here in the front. All right. So uh, recommendations for an anti-anxiety, excuse me, for episod episodic anxiety in adults mm -hmm. when 10 milligrams <clears throat> of diazepam does nothing. So just for, we don't need something for all the time, we need something for PRN when it happens, but 10 milligrams of Valium, you don't even know she's had it. So uh, that, that's a common scenario. There are some um, Angelman syndrome individuals that have a hard time, like when they are going to have a flight, right. and, and that can be a very challenging situation. So uh, yeah, uh, benzodiazepines seem to be the, the best choice for, for that because they are short acting and they, they can be very effective. Something that we always encourage is to try them before the trip. Because you don't want to try the first time because once in a while you have individuals that have a, an opposite reaction and and it doesn't yeah, she work has for not, them. no reaction i mean it, it doesn't works make for it her worse. it doesn't make it better we've yep. gone from 2.5 to 10 it's just like water so is there any other anti-anxiety we can give on a prn that might we could try you can do the lorazepam is there a reason you don't want to use the same she said it's not effective it's totally not effective. Okay. Totally. You can't even tell she's had it with 10 milligrams. So, so. You can use lorazepam. Okay. Uh, you can use uh, propanolol can be used to for uh, propanolol is not actually like a, a benzodiazepine. It's right. technically it's not an anxiety medication, but it has a nice calming and relaxing effect. So lorazepam and propranolol. Mm -hmm. And I might just add clonidine as well. Oh, okay. Um, One-time dosages. It's also just good to make sure that you've used a high enough dosage. So diazepam 10 is a high enough dosage. We can cross that one off the list. Um, dosages that high can also cause paradoxical reactions where some people are more upset or more agitated. So um, that, you know, Ativan, absolutely. Propranolol between, one, between 10 and 40 milligrams at one time, uh, starting as low as you can and uh, trying beforehand. Um, clonidine, those are the ones that come to mind to me. Potentially Benadryl. Some people had improvement with that. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. I think this is this brings up a good question, though. If one benzodiazepine has not been successful, are there is there rationale to try a different one? And like, if diazepam isn't working, switching to lorazepam. I, I think you can try an alternative one. Uh, they have a little bit of different mechanisms, and uh, you know there are similar drugs that can function different in different individuals. Like I like to go back to the example of like Zyrtec and Claritine. Like some people do great on Claritine, and others do well on Zyrtec, and they are kind of similar mechanisms, but not quite the same. Great. Good morning. Uh, my question is about melatonin. Uh, we have a two-year-old daughter who, when she falls out of her sleep schedule, 
we'll try a week-long dose of melatonin. Lately, we've been noticing that at the beginning of that week, the melatonin seems to have an opposite effect where she's up for a longer period after getting those first doses of melatonin, maybe the first day or two of that week long um, session that we do. Is that normal to see in children with melatonin when we're dosing with melatonin? Or is that something that we should um, be conscious of? Uh, I, I, it's not a common reaction. I would say that it, melatonin you know, there's this trial that was done in kids with Angelman, and then there have been other trials done with kids with other developmental delays, and that's not been reported as a common reaction. So, but everybody's different, and some people can have reactions that aren't in the textbooks. Um, you might take a look to see what the dosage is of the melatonin and see in, I think, about a one to eight milligram dosage. If it's a really low dosage, it's possible that it might be worth trying a higher dosage. Um, with fingers crossed, <laughs> they're not gonna make the situation worse. But if it's potentially just um, luck of the draw that sleep is worse on the days that they're getting the medication, that it's possible it's just not doing anything. And so a higher dosage may be worth trying. Above eight milligrams is probably not dangerous, but it's probably not doing anything additional. Um, and then just looking to see, are you doing anything different on the nights that she's, I think it was she, that she's getting melatonin. Is there anything different about that nighttime routine? Is there more interaction? Is there more contact? Is there anything from a behavioral standpoint that might be different that day as well? Um, just some thoughts I had. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, but I don't know if you can hear me or not. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thanks, panel, and thanks, AS, for having the panel. Uh, I would request if you can also put up your address or telephone number or something contact information for us that'll be helpful and uh, my question is i have a son who's 21 years old he has uh, he doesn't have a deletion but he has an imprinting uh, with him i see that he wants to socialize he wants to be with everybody which is a common thing for all angelmans but somehow the biometric pressure like if suppose today he's outside and the temperature suddenly becomes hot or cold or it's raining or it's cloudy or something from being happy he just becomes he starts getting tremors and like an anxiety so it is affecting his uh you know interaction and uh, he's not able to live his life because i'm constantly in a worry situation that like today we are going outside we're having fun and suddenly it's become hot and he starts he just becomes he has muscle spasms and you know it's like the day is gone uh he is on kepra and also they have the doctor has suggested to give him clonazepam as need be basis which we do and give him but it's a constant i don't know it's an anxiety issue or what it is i don't know if it's common with other angelman kids i do not know that's why i have come here to see if others it's like the any biometric pressure have you all seen in your research it just impacts the kids so that's my question great question any advice so um the temperature re regulation is a common challenge for um, individuals with angelman syndrome so that is is likely to if they're with the the heat issues um that is likely to trigger some more challenges. So, uh, you know, I don't know if you all have any, you can speak to the medication question, but the there is, there, you probably would need to plan ahead to try to do things that might help him keep his temperature down. Um, you know, cooling towels, get in the shade, do the things that kind of regulate the temperature as much as possible in order to sort of reduce that challenge from happening. Okay. Is there any medication or anything that we can give on a constant or as we need a dosage so that when he's out in the community, like if he's on a field trip, he wants to be, that's his, his passion to be around with other people. He craves for that. So when he's in the field trip and suddenly becomes, he's like, he goes walking and he's coming in a wheelchair 
And that's like, oh, what happened? I say, oh, there was like, suddenly he started trembling and he's in the wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that can be given in small doses when we know, especially when he's out so that, uh, because the school environment I cannot control, but at least where he can have a more value for when he, I want to see him enjoying the things that he enjoys. And when he is not able to, because of his condition, I do not know what to do. So. So do you think he, uh, when he sounds like he wants to be out? Yes. And, but um, something happens when he's out. Is that, that yes. he yes. gets too excited? It can or be a lot he of, get uh, he is on Kepra. I give him like a daily dose of Kepra, like a, a maintenance medication. Uh, but yes, he, when he's outside, uh, sometimes it happens. It just, uh, I think it suddenly becomes very hot or it's like, it's a cloudy weather outside, or I don't know, simple pressures and atmosphere I've noted that brings him completely non-functional. I wonder if it's a uh, hyper excitability, some, some Angelman syndrome um, patients get very excited and that can be a little overwhelming to them or, and, or is anxiety or dysregulation. Um, there are different things that can be tried to, um, to help address that, um, like a more like situational, like, um, you know, propanolol is an option, but that's something that you may want to discuss with your, with your clinician uh, about something to help address this uh, burst of hyper excitability and anxiety that seem to be interfering with his ability to enjoy activities, right? Yes. So I should uh, talk to my neurologist or something and get um, for these uh, burst of anxiety medications. I, I, I get that impression. It's, it's hard to, you know, give a, a her recommendation without getting like a full history, <laughs> but sounds like, uh, you know, something that is short acting could be a starting point, like propanolol that we were talking that helps alleviate calm and uh, okay. like, and can be used on a, like a episode basis, like okay. as opposed to, you know, a medicine that he takes all the time. So we can use these medications as need be basis and give it to the school or tell them uh, if, if you see the triggering to, so does it uh, suppress those? There are some medications that can be used in that, okay. that, that way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And then also just thinking about making sure that the school is providing a calm, um, cool environment for social interaction. And that may be more of an accommodation kind of thing that the school needs to put into even potentially an IEP plan to ensure that he has the opportunity for social interaction outside of the hot environment, um, because this is part of Angelman. Um, thank you for your question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question up here in the front. Hi, my son is two and a half year old, mm -hmm. and um, he's just started exhibiting aggressive behaviors. Uh, pulling hair is common, but now hitting has started and um, a lot of other aggressive behaviors have started. And um, I, uh, looking at those ABCs, it makes sense that he wants to communicate and all of those things. But my question is, um, should we discipline him as we do a typical child? Uh, timeouts, do they work with him or do they not? Should I even go down that route or what would work? Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh. So typically for a two year old, you know, I wouldn't encourage timeouts. What I specifically, what we're trying, what he's doing is with his hitting and biting, he wants your attention, right? So what I would do is when he's good, I would say, you know, give him attention. Or, or if he's saying, you know, if he's hitting you, I would say gentle hands, right? Nice job. Use your gentle hands. So using words like that, so you can redirect the hitting to something more nice. Oh, you want to throw it here? Let's put it nicely in the box. So instead of giving timeouts, I would redirect that. And for, you, we'll use words like gentle hands, nice touch, and focus attention on those things. Nice job. You did a nice job with nice hands. Got it. Um, but what, I mean, this takes, uh, this obviously is going to be a lot of practice on our mm -hmm. side and him understanding. But when he's just at that point where there is no consoling him, 
we haven't looked at medication options yet, but uh, um, I just don't know like how to get him to like co-regulate with us or self-regulate his behavior in terms of uh, all this aggression or just take him out of the situation at this point is what we do. Yeah, at that point, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't think timeouts are effective for kids. You know, the timeout, the concept is really hard. So I think if it gets to a point where he's distressed, taking out him out of the situation is really helpful. I also, I think distraction works really well with our kids, right? So, you know, sometimes I have bubbles in a bag or a squishy ball, just things that you can bring out. And you know, you know when the child is getting to that point. So you don't want him to get to the point. Right. You want to catch it before you get to the point. I think distraction works really, really well. You know, no hitting. Let's oh, let's play with the bubbles. You know, or you, you can't play with this toy. Let's look at this thing what mama has. So using those kinds of things would really help. And worst case to worst, I would take him out of the situation. And I'll just I'll just add that when he engages with whatever you distract him with, that's when he gets all of the attention and the praise and reinforcement. And so when he's able to switch gears from getting upset and agitated to anything else, he gets all the attention and praise. Um, okay. And that'll, that'll help reinforce that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you for your question. This brings up an, a, another question in my mind. So you talked a lot about working with behavioral specialists to help, you know, identify triggers, antecedent rewards, all these things that are going into all these behaviors. Who are these behavioral specialists that you're talking about? Is it occupational therapist? Is it ABA therapist? Is it psychologist, psychiatrist? Who, who are you talking about? And how do we access that, particularly um, when getting a dual diagnosis of autism is not necessarily something that's commonly done, but might be necessary to access some of these services? I think the easiest way is getting an ABA therapist. You know, ABA is not only for learning. It can be helpful in working on some of these behaviors. It can be helpful in toileting because they, you know, when you, when you parents are in this situation, it's really hard to see what's going on. So you have someone objective coming in. I also think some of the clinics have behavior therapists. You can uh, access some of, uh, you know, some of the specialist clinics, your development clinics have psychologists who are trained in this. So working with someone on a regular basis would be really helpful. I also think, I know this is really hard, but consistency is the key. You know, you can try it twice and say you give up. Our kids are very stubborn. They're testing the limits. So you want, you know, it's a battle of wits. Who gives in first? And they know that you will give in. So I think really, I always tell parents, try it for two weeks before you give up. Yeah, and just just to add, so ABA, ABA or a person who has behavioral, a behavioral, an, an analyst specialist degree certification and those folks um tend to be you can you can go to a clinic and see if there are behavioral specialists that are affiliated with the clinic or if that clinic can help you get connected to behavioral specialists in your area the other avenue potentially would be to go through your school system um especially if the behaviors are happening in the school setting then that could be um, something that can be written into your iep and I uh, don't want to be um, up too naive in this. I know that this is hard to access and there, there are few and far between in terms of the behavioral specialists that are out there. Um, but I think the only way to fix that is to keep saying this is what we need and to keep yelling from the mountains that we need more of this. Um, and so as clinicians, we're trying to do that. And as family members, you, you know, you kind of have to be squeaky wheels, but this, you know, keep, keep pushing for it because your kids deserve it. Absolutely. I would just piggybacking off of that idea. You know, um, there's, of course, this large evidence base that um, people with an autism diagnosis benefit from ABA. There is just as large a research basis that people with an intellectual disability diagnosis get better with ABA. And everybody, despite the fact that people can be underestimated in terms of their intellectual capabilities with Angelman, everybody with Angelman syndrome has an intellectual disability diagnosis. So insurance companies are denying ABA just based on the fact that we know the cause of intellectual disability, that it's Angelman related. So a letter from a pediatrician, internist, specialist saying they have intellectual disability. There are hundreds of studies showing ABA helps with intellectual disability and help with the insurance piece parent advocacy. One other additional thought I had was for adults, adults still need these behavioral supports. Just because you're not a kid anymore doesn't mean you can't still make progress. And so for adults, one direction to go for the ABA therapists would be the state organization that funds day programs, group homes, have, pays for behavioral specialists to consult to day programs and group homes. In some cases, the those organizations 
um, have been willing to pay for a behavioral consultant uh, to an individual family. And that's one area you can also apply pressure for your adult loved ones with angel money. Awesome. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Great. Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. So um, I am in Illinois and um, I'm, you know, ABA, I agree. ABA is a great intervention and uh, it doesn't just work for kids that have autism. But unfortunately, in our state, it's really hard to get ABA for uh, individuals that don't have autism. And sometimes families look for that diagnosis, but, um, you know, they, a lot of the Andrew syndrome patients don't have autism. So, um, so what do we do? Um, we try to find um, uh, referrals for behavioral, like psychologists or, or uh, therapists that have expertise working in behavior uh, with individuals with young children, with individuals with intellectual disabilities, which unfortunately there are not that many out there. So um, I, I think this is a challenge, but I think like knocking the door of your neurologist, your primary care clinician, uh, those are the ones that are gonna give you more information about the, those options. But that's a great question, thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much for coming today and giving the presentation answering. It's really helpful as a parent. <clears throat> um, my question is actually on ABA therapy. Um, we've been doing ABA therapy with my daughter, Abby, um, since 2016, and it's been helping with a lot of behaviors. But one thing that we've been running into is we may have a behavior plan set in place, but what you said, consistency is an issue. And we as parents could be consistent. I could educate the teachers and we could have that behavior plan, but it's hard to control everybody else in their lives, like other students. She may pull their hair or pinch them and the, and because it's attention seeking, we're supposed to ignore it. And But the, those kids, they're gonna react to their hair being pulled or being pinched. Um, and so that was something that it's been hard with the behavior for Abby to be consistent. Cause the moment it's pretty consistent, she'll go out there and then she'll do it and someone will react and she'll go, oh, it's working again. And then she'll go back to it. So that's been one of the difficulties for us. Yes, tips for how to. Yeah, I, I think that's a tension that a lot of folks run into. And, you know, because you can only control their environment to a certain extent. Um, and so there, it is important to sort of walk that line between behavioral strategies that, um, that reduce, that reduce the tension and stress and also behavioral strategies that help with um, being accommodating to the stress in their environments. And so I, I would recommend talking to the behavioral specialist about specific goals regarding interacting with other kids in the classroom so that so that you can start to learn so that she can the people in the environment can start to learn strategies that will help her in those interactions. Um, so that would be the first place I would start, like, you know, break it down into, okay, why is she going in and pulling hair of your of her classmates? Do the ABCs around that and start to figure out what you can do um, to reduce those behaviors in that setting. Okay, thank you. One other maybe thing I'll add is, um, this is a huge problem in the adult world too, where getting group home staff or day program staff to participate in it. Is it possible that the people who work with a loved one, if Angelman, could be a part of the meetings that the behavioral specialist could be involved? That way, their opinion, their take on it could be involved. It's possible that the teachers aren't following through because that behavioral plan is not working and that information needs to make its way back to the BCBA or the behavioral therapist so they can modify the program. You know, is there a way to get them um, to feel like they're a part of the development of the program? Um, and that their voice is heard, I think that is more likely to make them want to uh, follow through. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have time for one more. My daughter's 38 and she developed a habit years ago of grinding her teeth mm -hmm. and maybe a sensory, I don't know. We have tried uh, redirecting her by uh, clicking. And we'll start. So if you hear us at a table, she's grinding her teeth. We say, nice click, click, click. Everybody's clicking. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that helps to some extent. But sometimes she'll look at me and do it and see if I'm going to do anything about it. I missed the last thing that you said that people well, laughed at. Sometimes she'll look at me and she'll grind her teeth and look at me like I'm 
what are you going to do about this yeah yeah testing she has still testing attitude. those boundaries <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you all have heard a lot about the teeth grinding thing, and it makes me think, come back to the question that somebody had about pica. Is there something that can replace the idea of clicking? I hadn't heard that before, but it's a nice idea in so much as you're doing something else that you can't do at the same time as your teeth grind, mm -hmm. and then you reinforce that. Um, with a lot of sensory seeking behavior, that is a behavioral intervention that can help, you know, something that you can't do at the same time as the sensory seeking behavior mm -hmm. that might otherwise replace the action. Clicking has helped some, but it sounds like not ideal. Um, and uh, another option is things you've tried already, um, things probably like uh, chewy items that could yeah. be given that there may be uh, a way in which they're asserting their independence around the, the teeth chewing part of it, it's possible that it may need to be combined with a behavioral plan that reinforces uh, usage of a chewy or use it or the or the clicking the alternative movement that somebody does to sort of reinforce the usage of that um, or that it may need to be really close to them. So you're not looking around for a chewy at the time, but it's right there clipped to the to the shirt. Um, so it's as easy as just giving it to them right there in the moment. Um, but give her uh, something to chew on sometimes too, and that helps. Yeah. But then she'll take it out and she'll grind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. It may, uh, it may uh, need. To, I wonder if a behavioral clinician could introduce the usage of a timer, where if they hmm. use it for, if you keep using the chewy for one minute, way to go. There's a big reward that's coming up with that. You extend the length of time mm -hmm. little by little by little. Um, I feel as if a lot of sensory seeking behavior like chewing is very habit driven. So you can get out of the habit, like you can get into the habit. So you may not need to institute a behavioral program for longer than a couple of weeks to extinguish that behavior and break some of that habit. So combining sensory intervention with a behavioral reward system, you might just need to do that for a little while, maybe something worth considering. Okay. Great. Thank you all for the really fabulous questions. Thank you to our panelists for a fabulous, fantastic presentation. We're going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for the AS clinical expert panel. <laughs>